I'm going to talk about reality and poverty. Absolute and reality and poverty. Try to make some sense of that distinction, which is, it goes back a long way, and try to say something new about it. Um, the title of this talk is really summarizes the results of the, of the study. More relatively poor people in a less absolutely poor world. I'm going to try and convince you that that's the conclusion. And then we're going to go walk through the various definitions about absolute relative poverty. And strangely, although the idea has been around for a long time of relative poverty, at least the distinction between absolute relative poverty, um, there are quite a few issues that have not had much attention. And when you look at them closely, things look uh, quite different. Um, I'm going to begin by talking a bit about the theory, alternative approaches to thinking about um, the measurement of poverty. Um, then I'm going to take a, try to take a serious look at how we deal with social effects. And I'm going to define that. But specifically ways in which there's interdependence in society. Some people care about other people and they build that into the way they think about their own welfare. Well and that's not a very good thing to say, but it's just a foundation for how we measure poverty. I'm then going to turn to some numbers. We're going to look at um, new measures of absolute poverty um, following fairly traditional methods. And then we're going to look at some new measures of relative poverty, which use methods that have not become mainstream as yet, methods that I've been proposing uh, in recent times. Uh, and then I'm going to give you the first uh, truly global perspective on poverty. Uh, as we're going to see, we have not had a global perspective previously. We've had different countries and different worlds, developing world and developed world, not sort of speaking to each other, in the way they measure poverty. We're going to try and break that down and find a unifying concept for thinking about poverty in both worlds. Um, then I'll show, you the, I'll show you some results of that and finally some conclusions. All right, I'll tell you again, what do we mean by poverty? When we look at uh, definitions found in across the world, of course they vary, they vary enormously, we're going to try and uh, describe that and understand it in this, in this talk. Um, but we see a very profound difference between how poverty is measured in the rich world versus the poor world. In the, in the poor world, in the developing world, let's say uh, poor and middle, middle class, middle income countries, uh, poverty is typically, not invariably, but typically measured in absolute terms. What we mean by that is a fixed real poverty line over time and across space. Fixed and real value. In other words, we say that we do not judge, we judge two people with the same real standard of living, the same way, no matter where they live. We ignore the country residents. That is, a given real income by our judgment, we you know, just leave open the question of how we measure their real income. But if we agree that two people have the same real income, then we treat them the same way. We don't say one is poor and one is not. Right? That's the principle of absolute poverty measure. It's an application of an old idea that goes back to an Italian economist, Pareto, uh, in the early 20th century, exactly 100 years, 100 years ago. Um, how is actually implemented, typically anchored to nutritional requirements for good health and, and normal activities. That's a fairly standard approach. Uh, but it's also recognized, it's been recognized for a long time, that there are infinitely many commodity bundles that can attain any given set of nutritional requirements. So there's no one-to-one -one mapping saying that there's a particular nutritional requirement, exactly the nutritional requirements stipulated by the World Health Organization, underlying most of the poverty lines we're going to use today. If we just say that, it doesn't mean there's a particular bundle of goods. You can achieve, you're probably averaging around 21 or 2300 calories per person per day in this room. You can reach that, that number uh, with infinitely different, infinitely many different commodity bundles. You can taste the nutritious food. We'll get you to 2100 and put really awful 
going to or also get you there. So there's no, just specifying a, 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 a capability criteria doesn't get you to a, a poverty line. We've got to understand that, that mapping much better. So then the question is, well, whose standard do we, do we use? The tradition in the, in the World Bank, going back to the 1990 World Development Report, has been to use a deliberately conservative standard that says that we judge poverty by the poverty line standard in the poorest countries in the world. We look deliberately at the poverty line standard in low-income countries. That's not saying it's the only line you should consider, or consider as many poverty lines as you like. But the argument is that we shouldn't, it wouldn't be reasonable to use anything lower than that. So that's our conservative lower bound here. Okay? So we it says we shouldn't judge poverty in the world as a whole by any standard that's lower than that. Lower than the poverty line standard in the poorest countries in the world. Okay? And that's the principle that goes back, they said, to quite a long time. It goes back to a, a background paper I wrote for the 1990s World Development Report. How then do we talk about meaningfully about global poverty? Well, clearly, poverty lines are varying across countries. Here I've shown you a picture that you may not have seen before. It's an update. It's in the 1990s World Development Report. So but here it's greatly updated. These are poverty lines across countries. All the poverty lines that I can find. Poverty lines of governments, in most cases. Or in some cases, poverty lines of academics. In fact, pretty much every one of these lines now is a, is a poverty line used by uh, the national government. It used to be that national governments didn't set not many poverty lines, but not many national governments, not all national governments set poverty lines. But uh, that's pretty much not the case now. So we can think of these as national <coughs> poverty lines. And the vertical <coughs> axis is the poverty line and purchase power parity on the horizontal <coughs> axis, the local private consumption per person, also in the same purchase power parity exchange. Now, a couple of observations here. Right at the top, we have Luxembourg. I was in Luxembourg a few weeks ago, which, um, so it's the theme of the conference. First time I've ever been there, but I'm really curious. <laughs> Richest country in the world, poverty line of forty-three dollars a day. Actually, not much poorer than Luxembourg. I mean, you know, a little bit of difference there is the United States, with a poverty line of thirteen dollars a day. That's for a family of four in two thousand and five. That's a pretty big difference. I'm not saying anything about it. I'm just <laughs> um, the focusing on the poorest lines, well, here we've got this blowing up this portion here. And this is the $1.25 a day line. It's the asymptote of this relationship. In other words, it's the expected values of the poverty line found in the poorest countries. Now, of course, there's a variance. That's not surprising. There are differences in measurement methods, differences across the surveys that are underlying the poverty lines and so on. So we're going to expect some variance when we take an average. And that's actually the set of countries in the set of the time of the debt. There are actually other ways you can get to that number. Um, in fact, the paper that I wrote on the $1.25 debt line gives you about three different ways of getting to it, including various levels of, of difficulty. This is the, the simplest way. It's called the eyeballing method. We just look at the picture long enough and we see a dollar twenty-five. <laughs> <laughs> but there are very fancy methods, the econometric methods that we develop that get you there as well. You know, dollar twenty-three, dollar twenty-five, somewhere in that area. <coughs> now, by focusing on on the, the poverty lines found in the poorest countries, um, <coughs> where it's, it's deliberately conservative, as I mentioned. It's not saying it's the only line, it's a conservative line, you may consider a higher line, and, and nobody's going to, I'm not going to give you any quarrel about that. Okay, um, the second definition is, is what we find in the British world of the British world. This country is one of the few exceptions. And that's a, a, what I call a strongly relative line. The idea is that we set a poverty line Z, which is a constant proportion of the mean or median of the distribution. 
And we find that in, in most OECD countries, um, uh, the United States is the, is, and Mexico is now in OECD, so those are the two exceptions to my knowledge. Every other OECD country uses some version of this. Um, there's a bit of a question there. I mean, sometimes national <coughs> governments use slightly different methods. Um, the OECD itself and Eurostat use exactly this method, setting this as, this is about 0.5 of the, typically the mean. The difference between mean and median is not going to be relevant here. It's relevant in other respects, but not much to that. So, my question. Uh, Maybe this is of the other lines make sense. There's a whole lot of economics we could use to justify absolute property lines. Going back to the Pareto principle, um, we should treat the law at the same level and the law at the same way. Um, but this is not a law of the law. Well, it's a law of the law. How do we justify that? Is there any rationale we can use for this understanding? If you probe into the literature, we see two rationales. One of the first things they call the welfare as justification. This is an idea that rests on the, the concept of relative deprivation. Simplest way of thinking about that, if we think about a utility company, you say somebody's welfare in you, there's some money in their own income, why? And income relative to me. Right? And that's the relative deprivation. Relative deprivation. So this is own income, income whatever the, the money and interest of wealth we are using, and this is the mean. Okay? Um, this is wealth. Okay, okay that's the simplest idea. idea. We'll, we'll come back, back to that. Just, just, just hold on a moment. There's, There's another, another argument, the non-welfare non tradition, <coughs> where it where says, says this is uh, not found in economics much, but it says that there are costs of social inclusion, and those costs tend to rise with the mean. There are all kinds of ways in which you can't treat two people with the same degree of income the same way in different countries. Because if one of them is living in a rich country, they're going to feel not just relatively deprived, but they're going to need commodities for participation in society, which a person in a poor country would not need. That's the argument. I'm not saying I agree or disagree with it, but that's the argument. But you need a higher, more generous fund of goods to achieve the same level of value in a rich country. And that's true even if you've got a relative deprivation aspect going on. You're thinking, you're not going to be relatively deprived in the rich country, that's just that you need the clothes, the food, the socially acceptable. In the poor country, will not be socially acceptable in the rich country. There's a way in which that absolute poverty concept will break down. It will not be the case that two people with the same real assumption have the same level of wealth in two different countries, if one is a rich country and one is a poor country. Okay, so this is the rationale. The welfare is justification. The welfare is justification and the concept of wealth. Well, let's look a bit more closely at that. And I'm going to argue that although the entire literature is dominated by these two arguments, mostly the literature outside economics, that literature neither of these arguments is actually correct. They're both flawed. Neither of these arguments, which are defined themselves, they do not imply strongly relative to poverty. We're going to explain it and understand it. Well, let's look at it in the context of the case of the welfare as justification. Now, here the idea is that, that poverty should be absolute in the space of welfare. I think that's all we agree, whether you think welfare is utility, or whether you think welfare is capabilities, and then another issue. Whatever the concept of welfare you use, you should be absolute in that, in that space. We should judge people with the same level of welfare the same way we do. That's, That's a different, a different thing to saying we should judge people with the same real income, income. the same way. Here we're saying it's quite different. That we, we should, should judge people with the same level of welfare the same way, no matter where they live. So here the concept of this, 
not that. that. No, if, if you take the rule of derivation, you want to be well off first. How are we going to have a problem? Well, what we're going to do is fix this thing. We're going to say there's some new bars here. Let's take this one. We're going to say there's some new bars here. That's some fixed level of wealth. Right, that's our poverty line in the welfare space. We move the income space, to the welfare space. We're going to try and find the poverty line that's appropriate. Well, that's going to be some z, z over n. Here's now our poverty line, z. This is the money you need, given an m, to achieve this level of welfare. Yeah? Okay, okay, so, so what's the problem now and then? It's so that there's some function <coughs> z. There's going to be some function f of n. And given fixing this, this and solving for z as a function of n, we get our relative problem. But wait, we don't have to get it. It's a strongly relative problem. Remember the strongly relative problem. Is a constant times m. I'm not even consistent. Okay, sorry. Um, this this equation, equation we've already seen. This is this equation here. Yeah. Fixing to fixing u, we solve for z. I don't have to get z. It's some function of m. And my point is that generally that is not what we're going to have. Can anybody, anybody tell, tell me, me what is the special case in which we get strong relative lines where k is some constant? When? When are the strong relative poverty lines justified by the concept of relative derivation? All of this is anchored on the idea that people care about their own income and they care about their relative income. Okay, this is my. Very great question for students. Mm -hmm. Georgetown mm -hmm. students. You can yes. somebody get this right. When people are caring about their own income. Sorry? When people will be caring about their own income. Yes. yes. That would be the case of students. Yeah. Well, that, that would be the case where uh, you know, this, you know, depend on him. If, if people will care only about their own income, then the poverty line is not dependent on the median of the income. Exactly. Okay. You passed it. <laughs> <laughs> the one case in which this holds the quality is when this is a map. And you see why? Well, if that doesn't matter, that's saying you don't, you don't care about your own, own. all you, you care, care about is your relative income. Okay? Then, then when I solve this for z over m, I'm going to get, get z over m, m is going to be some, some function of the, the, the fixed level of utility. And that's, that's the k. If z over m is set as a function of the fixed level of utility, then z is just k times m. Then you have some relative value. But where we say, to get that, we had to make an incredibly strong assumption. We had to assume not that people care about relative income alone. That's not the contention. I'm willing to accept that people care about relative income. But I'm not willing to accept that that's all they care about. That people don't care about their own income, given their relative income. If, if they, they care, care about, about their own, own income as well as their relative income, then the other line is never a constant or in the mean. In fact, quite like generally, generally, it's going to be, it's going to look like this picture. It's, it's going, going to rise as a function of the mean. Only in the limit, only when we reach well above the number maximum. When you reach the real, 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 real punch, will it approximate k or n? If we assume that people care about their own income as well as their relative income. So 
the, the first, first argument, argument that's made for right, 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 Except under this rather extreme assumption. Well, what about the, the second argument? The second argument, remember, is this non welfare, for example, or the capability argument. That's a word that's really abused in the day. Everybody wants to do that. I don't know. Public money should, should allow for differences in the cost of social inclusion, and those costs rise with the mean. That's the argument. Okay? And notice, notice here, here when we talk about either of these approaches, we're, we're not, not saying that income is the measure of welfare. welfare. We're, we're saying there's a concept of welfare which, which depends, depends on income and depends, depends on other things. things. And we, we should anchor the whole relationship to that concept, not to income itself. Income becomes a money metric of welfare, a money metric of utility. But it depends on all kinds of other things too. Anything else that enters this utility function. Exactly. Yeah. The relative deprivation enters that utility function. Okay? So the five lines and back out the services will depend on the needs of the society that you're living in. Well, what about this argument, the second argument? The non-welfare argument. Capabilities is the is the the common rationale. An absolute approach in the space of capabilities translates into a lot of approach in the space of commodities. That's a quote from a master stand. And you can think of poverty. This is a version implementation of the stand argument. Actually, moving on, we think of people who are poor, but they don't achieve either certain societal needs, which are absolute, or they don't achieve relative needs, which are relative, specific to the country in which they live in. And those relative needs reflect these social needs. For example, that you need to be better clothed in a rich country to achieve the same level of participation, the same capability of participating in society as you would in a poor country. That's the argument. So does that give us a role in the line? No way. Let's, Let's walk, walk through, through that. that. Oops. The one case where this argument works is if the socially acceptable concept or the socially acceptable commodity bundle is itself directly proportional to the need. And that's sort of obvious, because that's, that's, that's what we want to get out of the, of the measure. But is that reasonable? Think, think of the, 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 if you said that social inclusion needs in a very poor country, let's take, take the argument down to the poorest imaginable country. Think of him going to zero. Would it be the case that the social inclusion needs in that country would go to zero? Social inclusion, inclusion needs will be positive. Everybody, everybody will be poor, obviously, but it's ridiculous to say that because it happens to be a very, very poor country, you don't need any social inclusion costs. And if you actually look at what people in poor countries spend their money on, we see them spending money on ceremonies, on weddings, on not much, but they don't have much money. But they are spending money on social inclusion needs. They're entitled, uh, you shouldn't quarrel with that, that's an important part of their welfare. In my view, you should. You don't want to turn on this about it. But, but okay, they're spending on social inclusion needs. And they're not going to go away. The classic argument here is uh, people love to refer to, including a nice extent, but others love to refer to a passage in Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, where Adam Smith talks about a linen shirt. And Smith says that in the uh, in the late 18th, 18th century, 1790, um, a socialist says that so every, every um, man requires, and then he talks about men, uh, it requires a, a linen shirt, and that's a social inclusion need. Well, the cost of that new shirt is not going to go to zero 
is that person lives in a very, very poor country. That cost of that million shirt will be roughly the same. It's never going to go, it's not going to go to zero. So the cost of social inclusion can't have the property that those costs are directly proportional to the need. There must be some lower bound to the cost of social inclusion. Another way of saying that is a strongly relative poverty approach will underestimate the poverty lines and hence underestimate the extent of poverty in very poor countries. They'll drive the poverty line down to very low levels in poor countries. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. If you use that Eurostat OECD method, you're going to be getting poverty lines of like 30 cents a day in, in the poorest countries in the world. Ridiculous lines. Nobody can live on 30 cents. The absurd one is even in terms of survival needs, let alone social inclusion Okay, so we've got a problem there. Neither of the rationales, the strong growth of the world, and I haven't known any other rationales, neither of the rationales make sense. They do not justify strong growth of life. In fact, I'm not going to have anything to justify strong growth of life. I'm waiting. Somebody's going to one day try to convince me, but I don't see any. I draw you a picture here of the poverty line against the mean. So here I've just shown you what, the, what it looks like graphically. The strongly relevant line has this homogeneity property. It goes to zero here. And as we said, well, that's just not believable. But more, it's got to have a positive intercept. And you can think of that as the cost of, as I call it here, the, the PG, the, the cost of Adam Smith's linen shirt, if you want. All right? Um, it's got to have that property. That gives us a class of what I call weakly relative measures, where the, there's a positive intercept of the lowest possible mean income. And that gives us an approach to relative poverty which looks pretty sensible. Um, it's not the topic of the talk today, but, but one implication of that, well, it's worth noting. One implication, if you, if you do this, the strongly relative line, where it's k, some constant proportion of the mean, then ask yourself what will happen if all incomes grow at the same rate? What will happen to the incidence of poverty or any measure of poverty? Nothing. It will not change. And that's been a big worry. For example, um, when the crisis hit Ireland, the financial crisis some years back, uh, the poverty conditions were, were, were falling. You have sat in OECD and were telling Ireland, well, the poverty is falling, we're doing very well. Mm -hmm. Ask, the poverty is falling because the poverty rate is falling, because the mean is falling radically. Right? <laughs> and there was no way if the poverty rate also had that fall, the poverty had risen by any imaginable concept. So we really need to jump this strongly relative concept. We need a weakly relative concept. Now the weakly relative concept, I have no objection to that. The weakly relative concept says that people care about relative deprivation, but they do not only care about relative deprivation, they also care about their own consumption of income. In the welfareist approach, in the non-welfareist approach, it says that there are costs of social inclusion even for the poorest imaginable people. They have a dignity, they have a need, a social inclusion need, which is entirely legitimate and just as much and maybe just as important as, as to somebody in a rich country. So both of those rationales can be preserved, but they do not give us strongly relative poverty measures, they give us weakly relative poverty measures. And in a weakly relative structure, if all incomes rise by the same proportion, then poverty will fall. All incomes fall by the same proportion, poverty will rise. A weak relative poverty measure does not have that property. In fact, adding this intercept here, adding this minimum cost of social inclusion, is basically the same thing. Mathematically, it's, it's, it's virtually the same thing as assuming that what I call the weak relative relativity axiom, the weak equity axiom, sorry, in, in poverty measurement, that says that if all incomes rise by the same proportion, poverty must fall. However, you measure absolute or relative, they're virtually the same thing. Assuming this positive intercept is virtually the same thing as insisting that when all incomes rise by the same proportion, all 
Okay, social effects on welfare. Now you go back a, back a, a bit. Okay. In light of what I talked about, why do we see this relationship? Well, there are two possible arguments. And this is a deep problem. Two arguments are, one, that as we move up this curve, the reference level of utility, is u by z, rises. That's one possibility. The other possibility is as we move up this curve, people feel more relatively deprived, or they need higher costs, higher, they have greater social inclusion needs. So there are two possibilities, but we don't know which one it is. We have a, an identification problem. We don't know whether this gradient is coming out of more generous welfare, reference welfare levels to define who's poor, a more generous poverty line in the utility or welfare space. We don't know if it's that, or this relative deprivation. Whether in richer countries, even more relatively deprived. Both things are implied, and we don't know which one it is. In fact, it's a really difficult problem. I'm not sure we'll ever know. What does that mean for our poverty measure? Well, if, if in fact the reason we get this relationship is that the reference utility level is rising, that rich countries use a more generous concept of welfare when they talk about poverty, and that's entirely possible, I could not, could not rule that out, that's possible. If that's the case, then we will be we would resist using a higher poverty line in richer countries. Because we'd say, well, we should be absolute in the welfare space. We should use the same level of welfare in judging whether somebody is poor in a poor country versus a rich country. That would be ethically dubious. Anything else would be ethically dubious. However, if the reason this line rises is relative deprivation, well, then we've got an argument for using a welfare executive would say, yes, I do need to use a higher poverty rate in richer countries because of relative deprivation or the cost of social inclusion. And we don't know which it is. What does that mean? That we have to consider bounds on the true measure of poverty in the world. There's a lower bound and an upper bound. And guess what? The lower bound is the absolute line and the upper bound is my weekly relative line. The true poverty measure must lie between the two. These are the two arguments I've just written it out here. Uh, social norms and social effects. Social norms meaning that richer countries have more generous norms to define poverty. Social effects meaning that the norms are the same, it's just that there are social effects on welfare in the two types of countries. Okay, um, given this deep identification problem, given the uncertainty about which it is, we have to think about a lower bound and an upper bound. If, if you think that richer countries use higher bond lines because they have more, they have more generous social norms, in other words, they use a higher reference utility level to say somebody is poor, okay? then you would not want to use a higher poverty line in richer countries. Because that would not be absolute in the space of welfare. Absolute in the space of welfare means that we judge two people with the same level of welfare the same way, no matter where they live. So if it's social norms, I mean, it's a, it's a good question, we'll go through that again. If it's social norms, then I would argue, ethically, we have no option. We have to suppress. We have to use only absolute lines. But if it is relative deprivation, ah, no, different story altogether. Or the cost of social inclusion, then we will need a more generous line in terms of income, a higher income line in richer countries to compensate for relative deprivation or to cover the greater costs of social inclusion to achieve the same level of welfare. The guiding principle, as we just, just as Sen wrote in his, his comment on Townsend in 1983, the guiding principle should be that we're absolute in the space of 
welfare. Whether you call welfare utility or capabilities is another question. We should be absolute in the space of welfare. If we agree to that principle, then we have to know which it is. Is it social norms? Is it social norms or social effects? But how do we know that? Well, we can't. I don't see any way we're ever going to know that. Maybe some very clever experiments that are going to get devised in the future that will help us figure this out. But as we are, as from what we know now, we do not know how much of that gradient is social norms versus social effects. If it's social norms, we should use an absolute line, so that's the lower bound. If it's all social effects, then we should use the weekly relative line. The truth is somewhere between the two. So instead of using one approach, let's combine them and let's look at both of these, these lower and upper bounds. The lower bound for the true welfare consistent measure assumes that the relative gradient only reflects different social norms. The upper bound says that the relative gradient reflects either relative deprivation or social inclusion costs or some combination of two. All right, let's look at both now. The lower bound. Well, this is familiar territory. We're now going to um, walk through some examples of, of absolute poverty measurement using um, the, the, a tradition that goes way, way back um, to the 1990 World Development Report and, and previously, and, and goes back further than that, where we use um, consumption or income and purchasing power parity across countries. In other words, we make exchange rate conversions that allow for the of the existence of non-traded goods, which are cheaper in poorer countries. In a poor country with low wage rates, uh, the classic example is a haircut. A haircut will cost you less in a poor country than a rich country. Um, so we need a purchasing power parity exchange rate, which allows for that. We can then convert uh, to the prices prevailing at the time of the relevant household survey using the best available price index for the country. Then the public rate is calculated from that survey using the micro data or especially divide the commission interpolations. And interpolation methods are used to, to iron out the fact that different surveys are different dates for different countries. The world is not also nicely coordinated that every country does a survey on exactly the same day, date as every other country. So we've got some messy bits of interpolation extrapolation, but they don't need to bother us here. Okay, um, in terms of data, we're, we're, we've been, since we started this business, and the 1990 World Development Report. Then we used 22 surveys for the entire world. They were the only surveys we could get our hands on that seemed reasonably comparable and, and, and <coughs> satisfied um, what we considered good standards for household surveys. That's now up to 125. It's been a huge expansion in household survey data availability. We're looking at nine, using 900 surveys, six plus per country. Uh, the, the overall sample size is now up around to over 2 million households. Um, and we're, we're, um, it's increasing uh, all the time. Um, consumption always preferred to income. I can go into why, but, but there's, the, the economics of that, in my view, in the statistics is compelling. Comprehensive uh, consumption aggregates. Um, here's where I do overlap with the topic of constructing the welfare aggregate for power, well, monetary poverty measures. And this is, let's call it here, comprehensive consumption aggregate. That's the key to that topic. You don't want to make silly paternalistic <coughs> judgments about what is and not consumption, what people decide to spend their money on. Yeah? And of course, it's not just the cash in their hand, it's also got to include the imputed values for all their consumption in kind. If you're a farm household, for example, in one of the countries I work on a lot is China. In China, the farm households, the poorest farm households, probably about 50% of their consumption, the poorest decile, is coming from own production. Um, okay, um, many data challenges. I, I'm not going to go through all of these things, but we've got problems with lags and uneven coverage. Some country regions where things are pretty bad, at least in North Africa, only 50% of the population is represented by a, a decent national survey. Uh, that's the lowest of any region in the world. And unfortunately, Middle East, North Africa, it's getting worse, it's not getting better. Everywhere else, getting better and better data over time. 
and the Arab Spring had not helped. <laughs> think of wood, but just to tell you, it hasn't helped. We haven't had better data. Now, one sign of change there in the economic research sort of what's it called, the ERF, the Research Forum, Cairo, which is a, a spans a, um, Middle East, North Africa, has done some, some terrific work expanding access to data, improving access to data across the, the region. So there's signs of improvement. Um, coverage will get worse as you go back in time. So sort of the further back in time you go, the bigger the standard error. Um, comparability over time is, a, is in space is often a problem. Um, here, although we've got more and more data as time goes by, we're also learning more and more about what non-comparable data looks like. We're realizing that comparability problems we didn't think were, were an issue 20 years ago, we realize are, are, are a continuing problem. And this is all household surveys, D DHS, demographic house surveys, uh, consumption expenditure surveys. We're learning a lot about um, some sobering observations on, on comparability. For example, changing the order of questions can change the answers in a survey, um, which is pretty scary. We would have said that in the past, if the surveys were asking about the same things, we wouldn't have cared whether they asked in the same order. <laughs> um, Worries about underreporting and selective compliance is a big issue. You may, in the US, uh, the big survey in the US is the CPS, the current population survey, which I've used a fair bit. And the CPS um, was, used to be uh, typically looking at non response rates around 7%. It's getting higher and higher. In China, non response rates are getting up around 40% in urban areas. Um, now, yeah, that's still, 40% is, uh, is, is very worryingly large. When you look at phone surveys with 70 to 90% non-response rates, uh, that's pretty bad. But um, even with that 7% CPS non-response rate, the bias I've shown in a paper some few years back, the bias due to selective compliance, the fact that rich people don't want to be interviewed or are harder to interview, that bias in inequality measures is non-negligible. For example, if I correct for that bias in the CPS in the US, I can add five percentage points to the Gini index of inequality in the US, precisely because you know, you've got Buckley's chance of getting Bill Gates to answer your, your, <laughs> your interview. You know. Forget it. Um, poor people, on the other hand, if in the US, if you look across across states of the US, um, the highest response rates are in the poorest states, in the deep south, Mississippi, Tennessee, and they're very high, 99%. Guess where the lowest response rate is? Where? New York. Give me an idea. Here. This is the richest metropolitan area in the US and it has the lowest response rate. DC is an unusual place. It has the highest inequality in the US. In fact, the inequality in the <laughs> District of Columbia is about the same as South Africa. 0.6 G in the DC. Uh, so it has very high average income, uh, very high inequality. It also has there's a duties distinction of having the highest average one of the highest, nearly the highest average incomes of any metropolitan area, and one of the highest income mortality rates and highest mortality from maternal mortality rates. So, a rather special place. Um, what do we see then? Here, here are the absolute measures over time for the world as, developing world as a whole. I'm going to show you the global numbers in a, brief, in, a, in a little while. But this is a familiar picture. We're seeing declining poverty rates over time. I've given you here the headcount index. It doesn't matter whether you use a poverty gap index or squared poverty gap index. We see the same basic picture. And it also doesn't matter what poverty line you use within a, uh, up to quite high lines. We're seeing this <coughs> reduction in poverty over time. Also holds if you exclude China. 
This is the blue line here is the proportion of people living below $1.25 a day. This is the proportion of the, uh, leaving China out of it, and here for $2 a day. Um, this is an aside, really. Um, Millennium Development Goal number one was achieved, as you probably know, in, in 2010, globally, for the um, halving the 1990 absolute poverty rate by 2015, we achieved that in 2010. Other MDGs have not, have not had quite so much success, so some have, some have not. Um, what about um, progress um, over $2 a day? This is the, in terms of numbers of, of poor. The lower line here is for people living un numbers of people living under a dollar a day. This is the band for between a dollar and a dollar twenty-five a day. This is a dollar twenty-five to two dollars, and uh, it's really dramatic, isn't it? I mean, you see this this, this dramatic decline in numbers of poor by this measure, but very constant in that interval between one and one twenty-five. So we're seeing a, a, a parallel decline for a dollar twenty-five. But we're seeing this bunching up just above that. Now, it's not terribly surprising when, when somebody gets, when gets above a dollar twenty-five a day. It doesn't so he or she doesn't suddenly get five dollars a day. Obviously, there's going to be that bunching up. But it is it is striking how much of it you see. Um, in terms of the composition, again, this is still the lower bounds. This is, uh, but now we're breaking it up by region. South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, East Asia, and the rest of the world. Um, South Asia, well, did change around 2000. If you just, I should put a vertical line here. If you just put a line yourself for 2000, you're seeing falling numbers across the board after 2000. Something really dramatic happened in the new millennium. Prior to that, rising bit in South Asia, or Middle East not falling, rising in Sub-Saharan Africa, rising numbers of poor, falling substantially in East Asia. We're seeing, since about 2000, we're seeing across all principal regions in the developing world, which is typically defined geographically, we see falling numbers and, of course, falling incidence of absolute poverty across all regions. Uh, it's also strikingly not just China. Up to 2000, we were seeing outside China a pretty, pretty poor 0.4 percentage points per year in the overall rate of poverty reduction. Okay, <laughs> this 0.4, this 0.4, it sounds pretty bad, this 0.4 percent per year. But that actually was, that's the long run rate of poverty reduction in the ritual. If you go back to 1820, the poverty rates in what is the rich world today, Western Europe, North America, Australia, New Zealand, the poverty rates there were about the same or even higher than we have today in the poor world. In fact, not just in, in fact in low income countries today. The poverty rate in the United States was about the same as Africa's today in 1850. So yeah, we know that the rich world got out of poverty. That's why it's the rich world now. The overall rate of poverty reduction from about 1820 to 1950, roughly the end of the Second World War, when extreme absolute poverty was eliminated in the rich world, that overall rate of poverty reduction was 0.4 percent. <coughs> it's a complete coincidence, but just to put it in perspective. Another way of saying that is the new trajectory that's emerged since 2000, when it's gone up to one percentage point per year, that new trajectory is phenomenally good by historical standards. Two and a half times the long-run rate of poverty reduction in the rich world. Long-run rate of extreme poverty reduction. Obviously, the long-run rate of relative poverty reduction by, say, the common standard that's used in the United States, the official US poverty line, line the long-run rate of poverty reduction since 1970 is zero. But the extreme poverty rate was falling at about 0.4% on average um, over this longer period. Um, I'm going to put a question mark next to that. I think I'd like 
I had a secretary once who would write question, 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 20 different you know, exclamation mark, and I should do the same thing. You know, I, I find it totally incredible that this kid just happens to be at the ratification of the, the Millennium Summit, which ratified the NDGs. I don't for a moment believe that's what did it. But I can't prove that, and they can't prove the opposite. Um, I'm an MDG skeptic, so I should put multiple question marks there. But it is striking about the, the extent of the discontinuity is, is striking. I also, of course, an SDG skeptic, and but, but believe me, the SDGs, the S is not does not stand for silly. It's not the silly development goals. It may look like it. It's the sustainable development goals. <laughs> anyway, um, across regions, East Asia. Dramatic. South Asia, um, if we go back to 1980, you know, um, Africa had a lower poverty rate than either South Asia or East Asia. They all kind of came together around 1986, 6 to 88, divergence. But look, still, after about 2000, all going in the, in the right direction. So that's the good news. All right, that's the lower bound, the upper bound. Now you see, you've seen probably some of this stuff before, but let's look at the upper bound, the new weekly relative poverty measures. These are weekly relative lines calibrated to national lines. So essentially what I'm going to do is fit this, this, this diagram that I showed you before. I'm going to fit it to the national poverty lines. Another way of saying this is I'm going to say, for the weekly relative measure, I'm going to say that you're poor if you're, you're not poor, if you're neither absolutely poor, nor poor by the standards typical of the country you live in. If you're, now in some countries you may be, the international line may be somewhat above the poverty lines found in the country you live in, there not, not many cases of that. But quite often the reverse, the national poverty line is above the international poverty line. That's no surprise, because the international poverty line is anchored to the poverty lines found in the poorest countries. Yeah? So I'm going to say that you're not poor if you're neither absolutely poor nor poor by the standards of the country you live in. And that's going to be the upper bound. Yeah? So that's a, an empirical implementation of the weekly relative idea. What do the lines look like? So, you know, actually fitting this thing is, is not terribly difficult. It's an econometric field it's called the threshold model uh, that was estimated by uh, Bruce Hansen in econometric field 10 years ago. We just didn't implement that. And, and that's one of the other methods we use to get to the dollar twenty-five day line. In other words, we estimate a piecewise linear function, which is flat here. We estimate this as a parameter. And we estimate this as a parameter. That's about one half, one half of the mean. But remember, it's not a strongly relative line. The one half seems to be about right in the, in the relative lines, but the big difference is this intercept here, as I've emphasized. Okay? What do the lines look like? This is just um, between 1981 and 2008. We're talking about a, a um, um, upper bound lines going from about two dollars to three dollars a day, and this is a pattern across regions. Obviously, it's going to be higher in richer regions. It's highest in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, higher in Latin America and, and the Caribbean, um, and it's rising, of course, because of rising of the rising mean. But it's not rising proportionally. It's got an elasticity of about 0.5 to 0.6, not an elasticity of one. What does it look like to combine the two now? We've got an upper bound and a lower bound. This you've seen already. And here's the upper bound now. The upper bound proportion of people living in poverty according to the upper bound, that upper bound poverty rate is also falling. So that's good news. Now remember, by my logic that I've explained to you, I don't know. The true measure is somewhere between the two. Where it is depends on that point about social norms versus social effects. If I think it's all social norms, then I should be looking at this one. If I think it's all social effects on welfare, relative deprivation, social inclusion, then I should be looking at this line. But if I'm going to be 
truthful, rigorous about this, I've got to, we've got to admit that we don't know. If we take social effects seriously, and I think we have to, and the literature is very compelling now, it's got more and more evidence that people feel relative deprivation. There are costs of social inclusion, and they do rise with average income. I don't think any of that's contentious anymore. But if we take it seriously, we've got a big problem. We can't say whether the true global measure, we can't say where it is in this interval. We've got to look at both, the upper line and the lower line, until we resolve this. Um, when we look at numbers, so this is percentages, this is the poverty rate. When we look at, at numbers of people, it doesn't look so good. In fact, and that's here's the, in a nutshell the title of my talk, remember? We're seeing falling absolute poverty and rising relative poverty. The top line there are the numbers, the very top line here is the poverty rate by the upper bound, upper bound. This line is obviously the, the poverty count, sorry, the poverty count by the lower bound. So what we're seeing is rising numbers of relatively poor, falling numbers of absolutely poor, and a substantial increase in this interval between the two. Now, if you've been following what I'm talking about, this isn't very surprising. In fact, this rise is the other side of the coin to this fall. Yeah? The success we're having against absolute poverty, higher rates of poverty reduction, higher growth rates, that success is going to mean more relative poverty. The two are kind of hand in hand. So it's not awfully surprising, but that's certainly what that's what it looks like. Across regions, relative being absolutely poor, and here are the numbers of who are absolutely poor. 22% Absolutely poor, 47% relatively poor. Relatively, relatively poor and absolutely poor. Now let's look at the global picture. So now I'd argue that we have a, a unifying concept. We don't need to have a different way of measuring poverty in rich countries versus poor countries. Everywhere we use weekly relative. The upper bound, we have the two bounds, lower and upper bound, and we use absolute for the lower bound. So now let's take that globally. Let's look at not just the developing world, it's now called the rich world. And let's see what we learn. Well, this is everything, it all in a nutshell. Um, here I've given you the truly global poverty rate by the, the um, weekly relative, that's the upper bound, global. Right? I should write upper bound, but for the entire world as a whole. Where I've, I've used, we're obviously in rich countries, I'm using how much higher poverty lines, not with elasticity of one, but, but getting high, uh, elasticity is going to be getting quite high in rich countries. It won't be one, but it will be quite a lot higher than uh, 0.7, for example, because of 0.8, 0.9, right? Um, so that's the truly global poverty rate, 50% in falling, but very slowly. Here we have the absolute poverty rate for the developing world, so that's what I've shown you already. Then we have the poverty rate for high income countries and the purely relative poverty rate for the developing world. And here's, the less, here's the striking thing. Look what's happening. We're all converging. In fact, now, relative, there's more relative poverty in the developing world than the individual. It's overtaken. And the intersection was about 2007. Now, relative poverty is not just something in the rich world. In fact, the relative poverty rate is higher now than the developing world. And it's been rising, the purely relative, obviously it's been rising, and obviously the, in, the, in the high income countries it's pretty flat. So because it has to be a catch up, and it turns out it was a few years ago. The purely relative rate is that up is is the upper bound if you like upper bound less the lower bound yeah, yeah that's right it's the, it's the the bit in the middle okay um, the numbers um, this is um, the poverty rate I've given you a poverty gap index numbers of poor um, over time um, the, for the 
Uh, granted, the global total is at 49.8%, 44%. For the 50 percent, 99 down to 44 um, percent. In the high-income countries, sort of rising over the over the whole period, but basically pretty flat since in, in the last 10 years or 15 years. Pretty flat in the developing in the high-income countries. In the, in the developing world, the total is falling, but the, the bulk of that is coming from this dramatic decline in absolute poverty. The relative component, in fact, is rising. And this is just a graphic demonstration at that point. If you look back to 1990, the bulk of poverty in the world was absolute, was absolute poverty. Now, the, the relative poverty is, is, is dominant. OK, observations. This is summarizing. We're pretty much finished summarizing um, the main points. The global poverty rate has been, been falling steadily, but not dramatically, over this period. Um, underlying this, we've seen a sharply falling absolute poverty in the developing world, rising relative poverty rates in both worlds, and there's a clear sign of convergence. In fact, now uh, the relative poverty rate in the developing world has overtaken the relative poverty rate in the rich world. Now, of course, it's a relative poverty rate, so that's using a higher poverty line in real income in rich countries and poor countries. Yeah, you've got to, that's, you can't have one without the other. So but there's a convergence in the relative poverty rates between these two worlds. Um, relative poverty is now overwhelmingly a problem in, um, uh, of the developing world. Uh, that was the percentages in terms of numbers of people. Overwhelmingly, relative poverty problem in the world as a whole is in the developing world, it's not in the rich world. In terms of the poverty counts, um, 9 out of 10 people who are poor by the typical standards of the country in the world one lives in, but not absolutely poor, now found in the developing countries. And that's pretty striking. 90% of those who are poor are this typical standard of the country they live in, but not absolutely poor, 90% of those are in the developing world. So conclusions, I, I think I've said all of this. Um, big improvements on data. Um, I think the, the, um, that's fairly compelling. Rising numbers, falling numbers of absolute uh, poor, rising numbers of relatively poor. And this is getting obviously more contentious, and I've put on a table one approach, and, um, and I welcome efforts to improve it. Um, but I think we do have to take these relative and social needs and social effects, and we, uh, we have to take these items seriously in the way we think about global poverty, and we have to look for a concept that unifies both. Um, Slow progress against relative poverty can be seen, as I've emphasized, as the other side of the coin to success against absolute poverty. I'm not saying we've suddenly discovered a whole lot of poverty that we didn't know anything about. It's always been there. It's been generated by our success against absolute poverty. But we also have to recognize that it is poverty. It's not some crazy idea of Eurostat. This is a concept of poverty that is intellectually defensive, in my view. Um, some implications for policy. I, I think the absolute versus relative, and you can see I, I'm going to break that down completely. It's no longer an absolute versus relative idea. It's absolute in the welfare space. The issue is how do you implement absolute in the welfare space, recognizing the, the identification problem. You don't know whether it's social norms or social effects. Both measures are then needed, one providing an upper bound, one providing a lower bound. Growth versus redistribution, well, one obvious implication of this is it's going to shift if you accept this, and it really comes hand in hand with the arguments about social inclusion needs and relative deprivation. It's going to shift to have a, a, our discussion much more to redistribution away from economic growth in you know, reducing poverty. Economic growth is going to be much more effective in the lower bound. The upper bound is going to depend much more on redistribution. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.